And now, more sports and torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris. Welcome back to Sports and Torts on TalkZone.com. I am still Elliot Harris, and our next guest is a fourth-round draft choice who went on to have a pretty decent NFL career. Sonny Jerkinson started off with the Philadelphia Eagles, ended up with the Washington Redskins. He was a five-time Pro Bowl selection, made the 1960s All-Decade team. Uh, He's on the list of 70th greatest Redskins. I would probably say you could make that a much more compact list and he'd still be there. Anyway, here is... David Spada with Sonny Jurgensen. How did you end up with Duke? I never understood that. I mean, because Duke wasn't a big football player last time, was it? Well, yes, it, it was. I mean, we went up, and when I was at Duke, we went up and played Ohio State and beat them. We, we beat Nebraska in the Orange Bowl. Uh, yeah, it was a good football program at the time. We didn't throw the ball. I only threw it 53 times my senior year in college. Because, I mean, you're known as the guy who loved to throw the football. They had to be tough on you. Well, the only people that were throwing the ball in that era was Georgia probably threw the ball more than anything else. I really thought about going to school there, and uh, it would have probably facilitated my professional career because, uh, you know, in that era, you played both ways. I played safety. I was leading the nation in interceptions at one time. Uh, playing safety, but uh, you know it was, it was a different style of football then. And then you get to go to the Eagles, and then you're backing up Norm Van Brocklin, who was a phenomenal quarterback. Did you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to learn a lot from Norm, and then when Norm retires, I'll be ready to take over, or is it like I want to get in there right away and basically take over this team? Well. <laughs> When I went, I started four or five games my rookie year, one three. Uh, Cleveland, uh, Pittsburgh, and Washington Redskins, and the three my three wins. And Van Brocklin wasn't there in 1957 when I went there. Uh, what uh, he came in 1958, and uh, I Wait, did. He, I, he, he came in 58. Okay. And uh, he was there 58, 59, and 60. Uh, we weren't very good in 58. We won two games. We won seven in uh, 59, and we won the championship in 60. And then he retired, became the coach. And then before we got on the field, he gets fired from my job. And uh, Nick Scourge took over, and uh, I took over in 61. And it was, uh, we won 10 games that year. And we had a big year offensively. Uh, yeah, I, I learned a great deal. I mean, about the, we didn't even have a flanker when I was at Duke. We didn't have a wide receiver. <laughs> so it, it was a real different uh, style of football. With the Eagles, again, Norm came there and you were backing them up. Did he right. kind of enter you or did? I mean, because there was no, like, quarterback coach back then. You had the coach, and you had an offensive and defensive coordinator if you were lucky. Well, we had Charlie Gow was the coordinator. Uh, he was the man that uh, came to Duke uh, to work me out uh, because we hadn't, as I mentioned to you, we hadn't thrown the ball a lot. And he watched, you know, he put me through a lot of drills that uh, they do with quarterbacks, uh, they still do them today, throwing different types of passes and everything, and that's why I was drafted in the uh, the fourth round, and uh, that's how I was fortunate to uh, to get with the Eagles. Uh, they drafted uh, Jimmy Harris, a quarter, uh, All-American quarterback from Oklahoma at that time, and I think it was another guy from USC named Frank Smith. Uh, another quarterback, so they were, you know, looking for quarterbacks. Uh, they needed to, you know, get some people in that position to let them grow and everything. And uh, I was one of them, and to have the opportunity to be mentored by a, you know, someone like Van Brocklin, who was a legend, and uh, uh, I learned a great deal from him about 
touch-looking people off of, you know, just uh, learning to, to play the, the position itself. I wish you weren't allowed playing defense because, I mean, you had to think from, from both sides of the ball. When you're playing quarterback, basically, nowadays, you just pick up playing quarterback and be on offense, whereas by playing both, both ways, I mean, you'd be a quarterback and you can think, okay, I'm a 62, so I know what safety kind of thing. Didn't it give you kind of an advantage? Well, well I, don't, I don't know, but my, my college coach actually recommended me to the Eagles. He said, the boy, he's going to make a very good safety in the league. I'm going, what? <laughs> if you, you, you put me at safety, then I'm going to last a week up there. <laughs> it, it was a little, little different in, in play. You no, know, but it did. As a, a quarterback, and having to play defense, and then to this day in broadcasting games for the Washington Redskins, and I've been uh, in the radio booth since 1981. I, I did games when I retired in 74. I, I worked with CBS Sports and did games for them. But uh, to this day, I still sit, and I'm... And you look at defense, you're reading defenses before the snap of the ball like you did as a quarterback. And it does help, and I think it helped me playing defense. Did you ever think to yourself sometimes, maybe I should be playing defense for the Eagles so I have to go against Chuck Benaro there because I don't want to get hit by this guy? <laughs> well, he was on my team. He was, he was a great football player, a great leader uh, the, of, the, of the football team of the Eagles. He was the face of the Eagles until Van Brocken came, and then you had a, you know, two faces of the Eagles. But uh, he, he was, it was great to be around people like that. They had uh, an outstanding defense and uh, legends in the game it, it itself. So uh, no, he, he, was, he was quite a football player. At practice, did he play, practice as hard as he played? Because, I mean, it seemed like he would just be so intense, and he just wanted to sit there and win it. Well, he was a perfectionist uh, it, as far as playing. He, he was an instinctive football player. Uh, and so many times, you know, in playing defense, and the defense was designed to do one thing, and he would, and just his instincts would take him to the football, and he would be going the wrong way, but he would make interceptions and go back the other way with it because uh, he was a great instinctive player and obviously a very physical player you know, a dominating player in that era. Your broadcast partner, Sam Hunt, I we interviewed him last year, and he was talking. He says that a lot of times people say, do you talk to today's players? And he says, they don't know who I am. I go, come on, Sam, they've got to know. You're a Hall of Famer. He says, no. He says, they don't know the history of the game like we did back in the day. Well, it, it was different. Uh, you know, it's been a long time. You know, uh, I, the Redskins played the Cleveland Browns uh, this past weekend, and uh, I started against the Cleveland Browns. It was one of the first games I started, and it was 55 years ago, so how can you expect them to know, you know what we played? Uh, no, they don't know. They, I'm, a, I'm around the present team, and I've been around all the Redskins teams for such a long time in broadcasting that uh, they get to know, and they, they've, you know, you you talk to them, but uh, yes, that, that is true. They they have very they they very few of them know that you played the game, and you know, hey, there's an old guy that uh, used to play, but uh, it's a different game now than it was. It was a it was a player's game in the era that I played in. They played, and uh, you know, you called your own plays. I call my own plays as a rookie. When I, when I started, uh, the game was on the field, players played it, and, and nowadays it's a coach's game. It's a completely different thing. You know, they've microphones and the receivers and the helmets, and they're talking to them. And uh, I once told a coach, and he said, we can evaluate the play as it's being run now. We couldn't in the old days, but all the coaches in the booth and everything, can evaluate the place. And I said, well, that's good. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll signal you the play to the sidelines, and you can evaluate all you want to. And he said, no, no, <laughs> because it's a coach's game. They call the game. I miss the days with the quarterbacks calling the plays because, again, quarterbacks on the field. 
field, and they know who's hot, who's not, and they could basically use their instincts. And when you're calling the plays down there from the coaching box here, the players aren't relying on their instincts as much. Without question, you know, you you know who you could use psychology. You know, and all quarterbacks did it in the huddle. You know who wants the ball in a crucial situation, whether it be a running back or a receiver. It, you could be a running back just got a stinger on the play before that, and he said, give me a break for a play, you know. Let him just block or something instead of giving him the ball that he just hurt a shoulder or something. And uh, receivers the same way. Can you beat this guy? We, we need to move the chains. Can you can you run this pattern? And and uh, he says, yeah, I'll get him. You ask a lineman the same thing. Can you make us? We got a. We need a first down. Can you get this guy? Can you block him? And the running back. You know, you're. That's where the game was on the field. I mean, you're drawing plays in the dirt and everything else. So yeah, it was it was a great effort. I'm glad I played in that particular era. When you got traded the Redskins, then it would be a throw for you because you're going there, and then over your career there, you had some great players there. You had Bobby Mitchell, Charlie Taylor, and it had a, you had to think to yourself, now I get to really get to throw the ball. Well, I had great receivers in Philadelphia, too. Tommy McDonald, Pete Retzlaff, Bobby Walsh, and I, I had receivers there. Uh, but coming here, Charlie Taylor came in as a running back, and he was, he was a great runner. I think Charlie Taylor would have been in the Hall of Fame if he had to play defensive, if he had played a cornerback. He was just a great athlete. He played, he started out as a halfback, but he was an undisciplined runner because he was running by the linemen instead of giving them an opportunity to, to block. And they made him a receiver, and he was a great receiver. And uh, you know, you, and the job of the quarterback, and it, it's to this day, is get the ball in your skilled players' hands and uh, give them the opportunity to make plays. The quarterback can't do anything with the ball in his hand except get it to a, you know, a skilled player, whether it be a running back or a receiver. I mean, like Bobby Mitchell said, the only one who could stop Bobby Mitchell back with the. Uh, Browns was Paul Brown because he took him out of the backfield with uh, Jim Brown. Treat him to the Redskins. I mean, that backfield was incredible. Well, they they were trying to, I guess they were, you know, they made a trade with the Redskins for Ernie Davis. Unfortunately, you know, he, he didn't uh, have an opportunity to play with them because of his illness and he died. But... Uh, he was a great running back, too. I mean, they were going to completely Syracuse for having Jimmy Brown and Ernie Davis. But uh, Bobby complimented him, and he, he was a you know, great football player. He was so fast. and I mean, you just get the ball in his hands as quickly as you could and uh, let him do the rest because uh, he was capable of going the distance at any time. And then also having a tight end that was – an undersized tight end, even for that era, but he was an exceptional one with Jerry Smith. You mentioned Tommy McDonald. I mean, I forgot about him, but he could flat out catch the ball also, and he was fast. He was, uh, yeah, about 5'10". He was a, a great receiver. He had, uh, if he could catch the ball, he going to catch it. Too. He didn't drop many passes. Uh, he was also a halfback man out of Oklahoma. You know that uh, they've made a receiver out of, and uh, he uh, he was fun. He was, you know, we came in together. He was drafted third, and I was fourth for the Eagles, and we uh, we were very close friends, still are to this day, and and uh, still see him, and uh, you know we had uh, we've hooked up a lot of times and had a lot of fun playing. Do you have a favorite receiver, like a go-to guy, or is you basically whoever was open that was your favorite receiver? There you go. You said it. The guy that was open, the guy that could get open, and the guy that you you know you knew you could depend on in a cr in crunch time. The guy that would make the catch when you you needed it the most, and uh, was going to give you a hundred percent. And uh, yeah, you know Charlie Taylor was probably the best athlete I've ever ever thrown to. Because, you know, overall strength, size, and speed, 
you know, he, he was uh, and he, even a blocker, a devastating blocker. That uh, he was just a complete football player. Was there a defensive player who gave you the most trouble? Uh, all of them did that uh, punished you, that uh, put your lights out. You know, there was, there was you know, there were teams. I didn't think so much of individuals. Uh, Playing, you know, the Bears were a great football team in that era. And playing the Giants, the Giants were a very sound football team. You know, when, when you consider the fact that they had Landry coaching defense and Lombardi coaching offense, uh, it was they were difficult to play uh, because they played, I think they were the first, I mean, obviously the Browns were, but... Uh, they played great team defense, and you know you had they were just, just getting into with the New York Giants. They weren't completely into the flex. They played it the same way. Speaking of the flex defense that Dallas made very famous, you know where you had two, two, of the four defensive linemen, two on the line and two were back, and they played. And it was really a, a gap defense. But everybody was responsible for a gap, and they played it. They had great players in Robustella, Cat Cabbage, Rosie Greer, and Modulesky. I mean, the, the people that they had along, they had great football players. And uh, Huff as a, the line linebacker, you know, when you have that playing against people like that, it was very difficult. I mean, and, and with the Bears having, you know, Doug Atkins and Morris and, and and the people that they had there, it, it was it was difficult to play them, and uh, they you had to battle them every week. You did beat the Bears though for that 99-yard touchdown pass in the 60s. Yeah, hit, hit Jerry Allen. I think that was against the Butkus. Uh, I think Butkus was there at that time because I remember him chasing. Jerry Allen, it wasn't a, a real long pass. I threw it about 30 yards, I guess. But uh, they were in single coverage, and Butkus ended up on the back coming out of the backfield. And I just remembered Dick chasing Jerry Allen. He wasn't going to catch him down the sidelines. And I was thinking to myself at the time, I hope he doesn't spike the ball, because if he does Butkus is too liable to kill him after he does it <laughs> because he beat him for the touchdown. And I said, please don't spike it. You don't want to get killed down there. What did Butkus do after that touchdown? He must have wanted to kill you guys. Oh, he did, yeah. He, what a great football player he was. I mean, just, you know, the intensity that he played with every single play. And, you know, you, you, you didn't play anybody better than Butkus. You still got this intensity to this day. I just read an article about him in the Chicago Tribune, and ESPN was a little late sending him a check they owed him, and he wanted their heads. <laughs> well, that, that, that's people, they, their middle line, that's who they, they put it middle linebacker. People like Kim, Bednarik, Hoff, yes. They all need to get to anger management class. <laughs> and Sandals, his favorite picture is once got in his office. This is him taking down Jim Brown. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he talks about that to this to this day. I mean, that what what a classic matchup that was uh, when the Giants faced the Browns. I think you know they both won. <laughs> When they played, uh, they both knew who they were play, playing against, and it, 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 it was great to, to watch, it, especially when you weren't part, part of it. Are you this agreement that a lot, a lot of former players are that Jim, Jim Brown was the great, greatest football player of all time? Without question, yes. Yeah, he, he was... Uh,
that football coach told little us to go up and watch his lacrosse game. game. He said, what? And he said, go up and watch his lacrosse game. Duke's playing Syracuse. And uh, we went up to watch and saw Jimmy Brown play lacrosse, and he just ran up and down the field knocking people over. And they had to change the rules of lacrosse because of the way he played. And uh, they they really did. They they changed the rules because uh, he was just devastating. He was an All-American lacrosse player, he, and he was the best, best I'd ever seen at that game. What's amazing is Willie sent me a picture of him tackling Jim Brown, or trying to tackle Jim Brown, and it looks like they were the same size. Oh, Jimmy, Jim was so much stronger than all the running backs, and in uh, and, and talking with him over the years about running the football, he was so smart knowing where all the lines of pursuit were coming he could go around the end and make and be making cuts, anticipating where the, the pursuit angles were coming from the defenders, and uh, he didn't have to look. He knew where they would be, and that's what made him exceptional. And uh, you know, you, you go back and, and, and watch that at times, you, you know, and you see the highlights. And every time you see him running the football, you, you know it is something special. The quarterback given Washington looks pretty special too, and Robert Griffin. Without question, yeah, he, he's he's an exceptional young player. He's he's got he's got the focus. He's got the the smarts to play the position. He's got a great arm, and uh, you know then you have that lightning speed, the track speed that he has, and and you can see the game changing what the Redskins have done this year. For, Utilizing his talents, uh, you know, by going to the, it, and, and a lot of teams are doing it. They're going into the pistol offense, they, they're faking the draw, and they have so many more options of what they're doing uh, than the, you know, the offenses that we've seen in the past in professional football. But the things they're doing because they can. You know, he's one of the options of running the ball, and he's had a 76-yard run this year. Just against Minnesota, he just took off. Nobody could catch him. He's, when he walks on the field, he may be the fastest man on every field he walks on to play. So immediately he has the defenses on their heels, and uh, the Giants found out when they had to play against him, and uh, everybody that does, you know, on film, he may not look that fast. You get him on the football field, he is. And uh, they've done an outstanding job, the coaches, Kyle Shanahan and, and the offensive staff, and uh, again, in, more or less spoon-feeding him of what they want him to do and not just putting him back and standing there dodging and, you know, under pressure. Uh, they're, they're moving him and... Uh, because of that, uh, you know, being the face of this franchise, and he's he's from a military background, both parents, he's very disciplined, and and as I said, you know, he's it's going to be great. And the games have been fun to do to watch him play and what he's capable of doing. Washington's come a long way from when you were there when they had the first African American football player, Bobby Mitchell to winning a Super Bowl with Doug Williams, to Robert Griffin being quarterback. Did you ever see that happening? Yeah. Oh, yes. It was just a matter of time. Yeah, of course. It makes a difference. If, if they, you know, if you can throw the football, you're accurate with the football. You know, this, and uh, Doug was. Uh, Bobby Mitchell was a great player. And, uh, you know, you just have to look at his records. Yeah, it was just a matter of time. And, uh and it's good. It's it's helped the franchise. Who was your favorite coach to play for? Vince Lombardi. He was head and shoulders above. I played for nine different head coaches in the 18 years that I played. And uh, it's interesting that you you hear today and you have heard in the past 
of, of coaches with 700 page, 400 page playbooks. Uh, Vince Lombardi was the only coach I played for that simplified the game of football. We had few plays, and it wasn't how many plays you could run. It was how well you ran each play. So it was a matter of execution. And if you, if you execute, you don't need a lot of plays. It's making those plays uh, you know, work against any defense. And that was Lombardi's philosophy. You didn't have a lot, but what you did, you did right. And uh, it, he really did. He simplified the game, the keys in the passing game of reading the double coverages and the zones and what have you. And it, it, it made the game fun. It was, in 1969, was, uh, had more fun, worked harder under him than uh, any year in professional football. Tell you one thing, Sam probably tells you this. The Giants had two future Hall of Fame coaches in Landry and Lombardi, and they picked the wrong one to be the head coach when they chose neither one of them. Well, it's true. You know, I, I thought Lombardi was going to get the job, but uh, you know, and uh, I don't know why they failed to make that decision. Well, I think he went to Army from there, didn't he? Didn't he I believe so. Someone told. Someone told me the reason that they didn't hire him was they didn't think New York was ready for an Italian football coach. Well, how stupid was that? <laughs> That's what I said. New York had a big Italian population. What's going on here? But they yeah. said, yeah, New York wasn't ready for an Italian coach. I don't care where he was coaching. Uh, he, he would have been, he was a leader. He, he knew how to motivate. He, he would have been successful at anything he did. And, and, and he proved that, you know. Then he coached, he coached a high school basketball team, knew nothing about basketball, read books, and I think they won. He was just a leader and knew how to coach, and he was a great communicator. And I had talked with Paul Horning and Bart Starr and, and Boyd Deller and, and, and Max McGee and other players that had played for Lombardi. And when he came to, even before he was coming to Washington, they said, you will love him. You will love him because uh, the intense preparation you go through, you never surprised on the field. And uh, it, it was great preparation. And uh, it, was, it really was fun. And uh, I knew what they were very fortunate to have had him for any length of time. We only, unfortunately, only had him for a year. No, he was a great guy. I know Herb Adderley and Dave Robinson have a book out now, and they have nothing but great things to say about him, not only the coach, but the person. Oh, yes. One last thing. I had a party over the weekend, and uh, a friend of mine is a big New York Giants fan, but he saw you at a Redskin practice one time. He said about 10 years ago, throw the ball. 50 to 60 yards, just, just on a long drum drive. Can you, can you still do that? Not at my age now, I can't. Uh, I, I would need a week to, to work on it. <laughs> but I don't think I could throw, throw it that far. Uh, the longest I ever, ever threw was 82 yards in the air. But, but there have been players that said, I think Ruby Buke could throw it 100 yards. And there have been other, other people that could. But, but uh, that was pretty, pretty good for me. Bobby Douglas just could throw that far, but he didn't know where it was going. <laughs> well, it's hard to be accurate when you're throwing that far. Okay. Great interview, David and Sonny. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Hope you enjoyed Kelly Kulik and Sonny Jurgensen. I am Elliot Harris. You're listening to Sports and Torts and TalkZone.com. Thank you to our executive producer, Dave Olson. And we will meet you back right here in the studios at TalkZone.com next week.